when we had the radio show and anytime I got the invite to have uh, Josh Gates on from Discovery, uh, I jumped at it. He's just such a fascinating guy, nice guy, great guy, like the kind of guy you'd want to hire to be your friend 24-7, that kind of guy. <laughs> uh, Wednesdays, every Wednesday, you got the trifecta of Josh Gates. You got Expedition Unknown. You got Expedition X. And then you got the Josh Gates Tonight. Uh, this, of course, on Discovery Channel and also on Discovery Plus, which I think everybody should own because it's a fantastic app. Uh, I've got it. You should have it as well. And the only thing we're missing out, Josh, is a podcast. What are we doing? All right. I'm, I'm, I'm on it. I'll, I'll have a podcast up and running by tomorrow. Well, you're, you're one of those guys, you know, that are just so, so damn interesting. And you've got so many stories to tell. And that's all you know, these television shows and podcasting is, is telling stories. I mean, you've got great, I mean, like, I'm sure at a parties, you can't shut Josh Gates up because you've just got story after story, right? Well, I mean, that is the real privilege of, of what I get to do, you know, hosting Expedition Unknown. I get to go around the world and meet these really badass explorers and archaeologists and, and adventurers and play in their sandbox and, and, you know, go to these remarkable places and see what they're investigating. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's just an incredible opportunity to, to dive into these incredible legends. Have you met someone on one of these expeditions that you just couldn't stand? You don't have to say who it was. <laughs> the probability is, yes, you have met somebody, but you yeah. still have to do a television show and you got to work with them. How does that work? Well, usually it's not the, the, the main expert. Usually it's like some government security guy, some mandated, you know, um, in certain countries, you have a what's what's called a minder, you know, someone who's minding you to make sure that you're not, you know, disparaging the, the nation. And uh, those people can be annoying because they because they're like, you know, they're like nudgy HR kind of people. And uh, but for the most part, the experts are great. I mean, sometimes you get that challenge of like an old school archaeologist who you know, doesn't know how to translate what they're doing to a general audience, right? I mean, like a lot of these sites, you kind of go, look, our viewers, me, I don't know anything about this culture. If you're not excited, I'm not excited, right? So like, sometimes I, I'll say to these experts, like, you've got to get excited about this, because that's how we know it's cool, you know? And sometimes though, you get these old school people who are like, ah, you know, I've been doing this forever and I don't really get worked up anymore. And you go, yeah, but look at this amazing thing we just found, like get worked up, man, come on, you know? So, but for the most part, everybody we work with, they're great. I mean, I've had such cool experiences with these people. Yeah. I would find it very hard to believe, you know, I, I love history. Uh, again, I love all the stuff that you do on discovery and even the smallest finds, you know, some of these television shows uh i know the curse of oak island's not on discovery but you know like i'm such a fan of that show and i'm a fan of the lagina brothers and i think even when they find the wood pieces i get excited but people want the gold but every little piece you find you have to think to your to yourself you go all right this goes back hundreds if not thousands totally. of years somebody invented this touched this made this whatever and now i'm touching it present day that to me is exciting that is exciting. Like, I don't care if I'm finding a 1920 penny in the ground. That penny has a story. Somebody held that. Somebody dropped that. Why is it here? You know, I mean, that stuff is cool to me. Anytime you can reach out and touch the past, I don't care what it is. It's cool. Yes, I agree. Even if you're going into a place like you, you know, you're you, um, my co-host and producer. I don't even remember from the radio show. Nate, he's not on with us uh, right now because he's having power issues, but he lives in playa del carmen mexico and uh -huh. we go down there and visit them and uh, you know there's all these different places like es escaret and stuff that you can go through the mayan yeah. Uh, yeah and just walking and looking around and trying to visualize this was a community this was uh, a neighborhood for the lack of better words and and, and that these people are are, are 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 farming and getting water and playing and fighting and eating and sacrificing and whatever they're doing and you're walking on it right now as a tourist that's cool totally. to me that's really cool it really is i mean one of the things about you know cultures all over the world is that you realize that we're really not that different you know i mean we have different religious beliefs we have different cultural ideas we eat different food but at the end of the day for the most part it's like 
people want a family, they want financial security, they want a roof over their head, they want to enjoy life, you know, all that stuff. And that was true thousands of years ago as well. And so when you go to these ancient sites, you just sort of think, yeah, that world would have been so different than ours, but it would have been filled with people just like us. And we are, we are now living in someone, some future archaeologists, you know, uh, excavation site. So we're just another link in the chain, man. And so, I, you know, to me, anytime you can think about those people and walk uh, in their world, it's this weird connective thread to the past. I just think it's so cool. That's funny you say that. I, I think about that, about that from time to time, especially when I'm watching your shows or any similar type of shows, is that in the future when we're long gone and, you know, what the world will be, but we're able to take such good and, for the most part, accurate records, unlike past civilizations that we're keeping records by just uh, hieroglyphics or, you know, scrolls or whatnot. Right. And deciphering, having to say, you won't have to really decipher our civilization. Hopefully. Yeah, well, hopefully. In the future, <laughs> let's, uh, let's go hundreds of years in the future. But didn't everybody think that? Didn't they all think that? That they were like, oh, we got this. Well, we're going to be here forever. Well, our records will be fine. Nobody's going to. Yeah, that's true. Everybody, everybody thought they had it figured out. The Romans were not like, oh, this is all going to go away. The Romans were like, we're the end game. We got this. You know, <laughs> we're, this is it, man. It doesn't get any better than this. And we still can't find half their stuff. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So be careful where you put stuff tonight when you go home because you don't know. I mean. That's right. Everybody right now should make a family time capsule and bury it in their backyard for civilizations to come. Well, you know what's so weird? So many of the things that you find are things like that. Sometimes they're ritual offerings. Like in England, when they find these incredible, you know, like – um these these hordes they, they they call them viking hordes and things like that it's literally somebody buried in the ground a whole bunch of really beautiful stuff as an offering but it's kind of a time count it's like we're just taking this stuff we're hiding it in the ground and lo and behold that's some of the only stuff that survives from their culture are these things they buried in the ground i'm not encouraging folks to go out and start hiding money in your backyard but i'm just saying if you want to leave a little something behind for the alien race that comes and finds this planet in a few million years wouldn't hurt. Couldn't hurt. Uh, we'll, we're going to get in all the shows. I just have, I, again, you're just so fascinating to ask, pick your brain about this type of stuff. With all of your experience and all of your adventures, um, what civilization do you find the most interesting, almost the most mysterious? And we still don't have the answers that you'd want. I'm kind of obsessed with the Maya just because they were really... I mean, look, I'm obsessed with all of the civilizations that got really big. And re I mean, Rome, you know, is an amazing example of this, obviously, but like in ancient Egypt. But the Maya had this incredibly advanced culture. What they were able to accomplish in terms of engineering, in terms of art, in terms of craftsmanship, uh, just absolutely staggering. And yet they are really mysterious. I mean, their culture is, um, I mean this not in a disrespectful way, it's weird. Like their, their, their cosmology is so strange and their, their imagery is so kind of trippy, for lack of a better word. There's, the, the whole culture is just so remarkable to me. And of course it survives. I mean, we have Maya culture um, that, that survives to this day. This is not a dead culture. But, but in terms of the classic Maya, in terms of that empire when it existed, uh, I would love to be able to jump in a time machine and just head back to one of those plazas and just to see all of it in its glory uh, at its height. It must have just been – I think about the, the um, you know, the, the Maya were sort of down and out when the, when the conquistadors arrived, but you think about the Aztecs and just what the Spanish – uh, must have thought when they first laid eyes on this and just couldn't, I mean, it must have just been jaw dropping the idea that all the way across the sea uh, is this other worldly empire, you know? So uh, yeah, the Maya for me are, are, are one of my favorite civilizations. I thought I found it interesting when, when going to some of these Mayan temples and, and houses and whatever communities is like, if you think about it, their construction was very much like the Egyptians and the Egyptians very much like the Maya um, as far as, and maybe that's just a human being kind of figuring out, you know, square goes into square, circle goes into circle. But you, you look at 
the the construction and you know the, there's things that are that were built five years ago present day that haven't lasted because of our construction these people are building these temples and houses and whatever else they're building that have lasted for hundreds of years if not longer i mean yep. you, you almost want to ask yourself were past civiliza- civilizations smarter than present civilizations I think in terms of raw ingenuity, they were able to do things that, I mean, look, if you, uh, if you took the best engineers in the world and said, build an Egyptian pyramid, they could do it for sure, you know, but, but not easily. Um, and I, I think that, that, that we really do have to pay a huge amount of respect for the, the kind of stoneworking, especially that these ancient cultures were able to pull off. We really have lost a lot of that, you know, ability. I mean, you look in, in Egypt, at the the fine detail they're carving into granite, into really hard, difficult to work with stone, uh, basalt, things like that. They're just treating it like butter, you know. So, I mean, look at um, ancient classical sculpture. You know, I, there are there's almost nobody alive today, maybe nobody alive today, who can sculpt in marble the way that that they did. Um, in in Greece and Rome. So, yeah, I think some of that is lost. You know, that that kind of um, that kind of artistry, a lot of which happens through, um, you know, generational kind of teaching is just gone. Like we just don't have that anymore, you know? Um, but you're right. We, they also, they, they built things to last. I mean, it's amazing what you can do with huge populations of people dragging stones around. We also don't do that anymore, but, um, but yeah, they, they built things to last. But the other thing that blows my mind is all the stuff that is gone. Like when you look at the Maya, I was just having this conversation last week with somebody like, okay, you have these incredible pyramids, right? And that's kind of like the foundation of the house in a way, like it's there, but there was all sorts of other stuff on top of that, right? Like they were really good at carving wood and they probably had big banners and flags, all the stuff that just doesn't survive. And you sort of imagine if they were that good at carving stone, what would all of this stuff look like when it was painted and when it had big wooden structures on it and all the stuff that's just gone, you know, it must have been so cool. Yeah. And then a lot of, a lot of it, uh, if you've ever, you know, again, just my experience is going to see Nate and Plato Carmen, but you, you look at over time, um, you know, obviously the, the landscape has changed. So there has been some deterioration and there has been, uh, with the weather, the, the land is, is, is overgrown. Some of the stuff you, you wonder what it was like, you know, they'll have pictures of what it looked like. And then you look at it now and you're going, all right, it, it's changed. It's definitely different, obviously, but it really hasn't changed that much. And do you ever sure. think that the Maya at one time was like, you know, I bet you in about five or 600 years, they're going to make this into a theme park for, for tour. <laughs> well, you just, you just kind of, there's so many things that we take for granted about, our world that were so different, not even a thousand years ago, like a couple of hundred years ago, roads are a big thing, paved roads. You know, you sort of think about the Maya world and these cities throughout Central America, what it would have taken to get between these cities in nothing but jungle. I mean, pretty nasty jungle. The idea that we can hop in our car and head down to Starbucks and I mean, even America, I mean, think about America you know, people, I, one of the things that drives me nuts is when I'm on a plane and, okay, there's an hour delay on the tarmac and nobody's happy about that, including me. I mean, it sucks, right? But people get so angry about their delay, their hour-long delay. I don't care if you have to get off the plane and sleep at the Marriott, Courtyard Marriott for the night and try again in the morning. 200 years ago, this would have taken you eight months, half, you know, you would half your family would have died <laughs> on some wagon train. I mean, the <laughs> fact that we can get in a plane and fly coast to coast, the fact that we can get in a car, I don't think the Maya, I don't think anybody really could have imagined in their wildest fantasies the way that we would have made the world so approachable and, and you know, so much smaller through transportation. I mean, I think that's the great, you know, I mean, I, I even like talking to my dad a generation back. I mean, the whole interstate system in the U.S. was like in, built in the 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like prior to that, it was like, you know, Route 60. It was like these little roads that just kind of went across the country. And, you know, 100 years before that, it was trains and wagon rutted, you know, wagon trails. I mean, 
it, it all happened so much, you know, it, it really isn't that long ago. I mean, flight wasn't, in, I mean, flight's a century old, you yeah. know, like that's crazy. So uh, yeah, for me, I, I, I kind of, I sometimes you have to go to these ancient sites and go, man, think about all the stuff we have now that they didn't have and, and, and kind of appreciate it because um, transportation is the biggest for me and, and, and medicine. I mean, those are the two game changers, obviously, but um, the world, I mean, most people never went anywhere, you know, they never left their village because yeah. there was nothing out there, but death and danger, you know, they, they were called explorers. Like, so we would all be technically explorers because of how much we travel. Yeah. I mean, and even just getting on, I mean, if you get in your car and you drive for an hour or two, you're an explorer. You're I mean, that explorer. would have been on, on horseback. That would have been a week. You know, well, so yeah, it's, it's it's funny because I was going to say this before talking about the the construction of these things, especially from the the, the Maya, is uh is is I think the answer is patience. You know, we don't have patience anymore because we live in such a fast paced world and society. And you know, yes, you're going to throw in social media and you've got this and you got this, and we're so work oriented that we have to accomplish this. They had all the time in the world. You know, they they, they weren't. It was, it was uh, the only thing that they had to, uh, as far as a deadline was probably rainy season. You that's know? right. Yeah, that's all. It's like, all right, let's get it done by rainy season. When's rainy season? I don't know. Go check the, the wall downstairs. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it, it is also true that like some of the biggest stuff that gets built, this is a weird thing about cultures all over the world that always kind of blows my mind. Some of the biggest stuff that gets built, the biggest pyramids, the biggest temples, they get built first like really early on. So like really early on, somebody comes along and says, hey, you know, we're all sitting around here in the heat. We're all growing crops and just hanging out. Let's build some crazy stuff because I, I'm in with this God or I, I, you know, I can help make it rain, whatever. Some charismatic leader comes along and says, let's build crazy stuff. And they build huge things because, yeah, they got a bunch of people who are hanging around who could build stuff. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of cool it like a few generations later, they're like, all right, that was really hard. We should build some smaller stuff now. But yeah, <laughs> like in the beginning, everybody goes mental and like that all the pyramids in Egypt, that's like the earliest dynasties. And then later, everybody's like, all right, enough with the pyramids. Those are huge and difficult. Let's do some other stuff. <laughs> uh, but, the, you know, like the early stuff is the big crazy stuff because yeah. people get excited, I think, to build things. The three shows every Wednesday on Discovery and Discovery Plus uh, that Josh Gates has is, of course, Expedition Unknown. Uh, that's at 8 p.m. East. Uh, Expedition X at 9 p.m. East. And then Josh Gates tonight at 10 p.m. East. Uh, which one is the original? The, the Unknown is the original, right? Expedition Unknown is the original. So we're back with an all new season of that amazing season. We're going to be looking at secret Nazi tunnels, looking for Wild West treasure, lost aircraft, famous lost planes. It's a really cool season. And then Expedition X. Is, is our sister show that's more kind of um, the stranger side of the unknown, paranormal, cryptozoological kind of mysteries. And then I do a talk show at, at 10, which is a really fun opportunity to make a cocktail and hang out with some cool guests and, uh, and you know, uh, have a nightcap. So it's a, it's a really fun night. Those cryptozoologists are an uh, interesting bunch of people. I had a friend of mine in Florida that uh, was a cryptozoologist, uh, Scott Marlowe was his name. Okay. And, it's a good name. Uh, sounds like a detective. And he and he looked and he he looked like he was always searching for something. He had the gray beard. <laughs> and, stuff. and so in Florida, um, we went looking for. It's called the skunk ape, not Bigfoot. I'm familiar. The skunk ape, absolutely. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I know. <laughs> and, and then there is the. Uh, what is it the the is it called the green swamp anywhere it's in tampa um i forget what the the area is where the, all the sightings have been polk county i4 corridor and we went to stay the night and out there and it was it was it was it was cold believe it or not in florida oh. but it was really cool pitch black and we're walking through the woods like a bunch of idiots and that the, there were people there's a community that's so protective of this because as a radio guy, they're thinking I'm doing it for a bit and goofiness and stuff. There were a group, there was a group of people, I guess the cops got to them before us. I didn't know this until afterwards. They were waiting for us and they were going to come and ambush us at night. I don't know what they were going to do, but they well, were that's, that's Florida for you. It's, it's oh Florida. God. So with that being said, you know, with the expedition X stuff, um, 
these people are very protective of their big foots and their Sasquatches and their all that kind of stuff. Do you get any kickback like that from the community? That yeah, community? I mean, pe- pe- people are, as you said, they are very protective of these stories and they're really passionate about them. And so you meet people in those communities, whether it's UFOs or ghosts or Bigfoot, they are true, true believers. People who are just like, I'm going to die on this hill. This thing is real. This thing is out there. And I don't know. I mean, look, I, one of the things I love about crypto stories and paranormal stories is that most of them, by and large, when you go and investigate them, they are underpinned by real experiences. Like people really have an experience. That doesn't mean they saw a monster. It doesn't mean they saw a ghost. They saw something. And that is enough for me because then I kind of go, all right, there's a mystery here, right? Maybe it's a bear. Maybe it's a crocodile. Maybe it's swamp gas. Like whatever it is, there's something happening here. And so I love investigating those stories because there's something to them, you know, but you're right. There is a community of people that are really, really protective of those stories. And, you know, that's the funny thing about Florida too, not just those people, but Florida is one of those places where. You're like, all right, this is as urbanized as it gets. We got Disney World. We got, you know, Spring Break. We got Daytona Beach, Miami. You can get off the grid in Florida, and you are, like, back at the age of the dinosaurs pretty quickly. Like, mm-hmm. the Everglades of Florida, like, you, you, you could drive a half an hour and turn back the clock about 60 million years. Like, it's wild. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know. I, I lost my virginity in the Everglades. <laughs> There's a good joke in there. It's a, true. Yeah, but it was still a person. It was just a straight. I mean, my brother took me camping with my high school sweetheart, and we went. To, <laughs> I also learned to drive uh, in the Everglades. And, same night? Uh, no, not the same night. It's a hell of a night. Because I, I lived in. 